Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Ian Rams Centre and the Humane Philosophy Project, let me welcome you to this evening's session. We're absolutely delighted to welcome Michael Roos uh, from Florida, who has written extensively and eloquently about the whole issue of um, evolutionary theory, its relationship to science, to religion, and various issues. But tonight, his topic is one that I know will interest you enormously, and it's a question of this relationship between evolutionary theory and ethics. And as um, the title of this lecture suggests, um, this is all about the resurgence, the renewal of this, and I think it's going to be very interesting. So without any further ado, I have great pleasure in welcoming Michael Roos to speak to us this evening. Michael, thank you very much. Oh, well, thank you for... <laughs> I think my main claim to fame is I'm the person I know who's published the second largest number of books. I won't mention anybody here who's published the largest number of books, but if you look at my hand, uh, you might get some ideas. Uh, thank you very much for having me. And as I say, uh, that, that was a nightmare to be somewhere up the Banbury Road and realize I was not in the right place. Uh, OK, I'm going to talk about evolutionary ethics tonight, OK? It is something uh, that, as I'll explain to you, when I first started doing this over 30 years ago, it was rather like you'd made a bad smell at the vicarage, uh, or maybe here. Uh, but it, now people have discovered that it's interestingly wrong. And so, as I like to say, I'm now being refuted in journals that would never publish anything by me. Uh, so h h without further ado, let's get going. And the person I'm going to start with, I mean, I think I could trace it back further, but at least for this evening, is I'm going to start with Charles Darwin, who was uh, born in 1809, but as you can see, came to manhood basically uh, at the beginning of Queen Victoria's era and lived pretty much through the whole Victorian era. Two things. Uh, first of all, Darwin came from a rich family. In fact, his grandfather on his mother's side was Josiah Wedgwood the Potter, and he married a first cousin who was also a, grand, a granddaughter of Josiah Wedgwood. So one thing is Darwin was a rich man. He was never going to be a rebel. I think he was a great revolutionary, but I think that if you're looking at Darwin, you must always ask, where did he get it from? Um, nine times out of 10, either he got it from, uh, from political economy like Adam Smith, or he got it from the Church of England. Uh, I like to say that Darwin's theory is a bastard offspring of the Church of England, and I think one could say this with some c considerable truth. And I don't say that in a nasty sense. Well, only in a little bit of a nasty sense. Uh, but um, certainly, I think that's the way to look at it. And that means then, consequently, Darwin was going to be interested, although he was a scientist, he was going to be interested in issues like ethics. Uh, ethics was not going to be something for Darwin which would just be, oh, gosh, I should have thought of that. It's going to be something which was part of his fabric, if you know what I mean. So uh, although he did not dis discover or work on his theory in order to explain ethics, that was always going to be a major item that had to be tackled. All right, so Charles Darwin. Uh, as, as I'm sure you know, in 18, well, let me tell you, in 1837, after he'd finished the Beagle Voyage, he became an evolutionist, but realized he had to find a mechanism. This was the time of Newtonian science. Newton's great achievement was to come up with the force of gravitation. Kant had said there will never be a Newton of biology, and Darwin was determined to show Immanuel Kant wrong. I'm quite sure he knew about Kant because he was much mentored by William Huell, who was probably the English Kant specialist at the time. So he would have known all about that. Uh, he hit on his mechanism at the end of September 1838. Uh, it came very much, he'd already realized that the secret to changing things was selecting. This is what breeders do, and Darwin came from agricultural England, so he knew all about this. But he couldn't see how to get it to work in nature. And at the end of 18th, uh, September 1838, he read Thomas Robert Malthus' book on population. Now, Malthus was uh, not only a political economist, but he was a pastor or priest in the Church of England. And people often think that Malthus said that population numbers are going to outstrip food and space, so there's going to be a struggle for existence. People often think that Malthus is a kind of Thrasymachus out of the Republic, might is right. Not at all. 
Malthus was offering an essay in natural theology. Malthus was worried about why do we do anything? Why don't we behave like the average undergraduate, certainly at my university, get up at, at noon, go to a few classes, and then you're all set for the evening until three and you sink into bed, often not alone. And Malthus wondered, how did God get us up off our butts to do something? And so God, in his wisdom, created the struggle for existence, which means you have to strive and you can't just hang around uh, all day long. Uh, so uh, Darwin read this and he said, yes, the struggle for existence is the key to what I need for a mechanism. The struggle for existence leads to a natural form of selection, and this in its turn leads to evolution. But of course, not just to evolution, but to evolution of features which are adaptive, uh, which are uh, are as if designed. And again, where did Darwin get this from? He got it from another Anglican priest, of course, from, uh, from William Paley, Archdeacon William Paley. So as I say, this is what I mean by saying I mean, Darwin's theory was very much a Church of England theory. So Darwin publishes his ideas. We're not quite sure why he delayed so long. But he publishes his ideas in 1859 in The Origin of Species. So evolution. Evolution brought on by a struggle for existence. A struggle for existence leads to natural selection, leads to evolution. And what kind of evolution? The tree of life. And where do we get the tree of life from? I'll let you answer. That's an exercise for the reader. And, uh, but it's not just evolution. It's evolution of the hand and the eye and everything else. So in other words, it's evolution of adaptive forms. Now, in the origin, Darwin said very little about humans. He had always included us in his picture. In fact, the first evidence we've got in the notebooks that Darwin had become an evolutionist, or rather Darwin had discovered natural selection, is later in the year of, of 1838, there's a, note, there's a note in one of his notebooks where Darwin actually says, I think that humans have been subjected to natural selection, and more than this, human brains have been selected to natural selection, and that is why we have different characteristics. In other words, Darwin, even in 1838, was a full-blown full sociobiologist or evolutionary psychologist. And he never changed from that. He was always absolutely convinced that oh, culture is important, but as it were, it's based on our biology. In the origin, Darwin said very little about humans, mainly because he wanted to get his theory on the table, as it were, and he knew that as soon as he published, it would be the monkey theory, which of course it was. Immediately, Darwin's great supporter, Thomas Henry Huxley, uh, picked up on this. Uh, I love this picture of Huxley, because it, he was a great blackboard artist in the days before PowerPoint, and I'm sure there must be at least one person in this room who's old enough to have had teachers who were great blackboard blackboard artists and could come in and draw a map of Palestine in seconds up there with colored chalks. Well, Huxley was like that. He was a great teacher. And Huxley picked up on the origin and immediately saw the implications must be for, for humans. And so this is 1863 that Huxley is publishing and uh, showing pictures in his preface to show that folks we're part and parcel of the whole picture. Uh, although we know about the Bishop of Oxford Wilberforce being opposed to it, you should understand, in fact, very quickly people accepted evolution. It was rather like uh, the emperor's new clothes. As soon as Darwin, who had considerable stature in the, the scientific community, as soon as Darwin published, everybody went around saying, well, of course, I knew it all along. I didn't like to say. What's interesting is also people were in, uh, prepared to include humans, although Certainly religious people wanted to uh, exclude souls or something of that nature, as they, as they still do. Uh, but uh, what is also interesting is, apart from the fundamentalists and others, Christians were pretty, pretty comfortably on board with this, why, uh, including Anglicans. As, as I say, why wouldn't they be? It's an Anglican theory in the first place. And of course, it solved an awful lot of, of difficulties and fit in very nicely with the incarnational theology, which was becoming so popular in England at this sort of time. Okay, so as I say, uh, all of this. Then what happened? I don't think Darwin would have written extensively on humans. He had no intention of doing so. But then the co-discoverer of natural selection, uh, Alfred Russell Wallace, uh, 
took up spiritualism in the 1860s and started arguing that humans could not have evolved through natural causes. And Darwin was terrified at this and felt, therefore, that he had to write a book in response to it. Now, Wallace, although he was a bit of a wacko, was also a good scientist. And he picked up on certain characteristics which he said could not have been produced by natural selection. One was human hairlessness and another was human intelligence, because Wallace had, unlike Darwin, had actually lived with native people and realized that they were not using all that they could use, but they had the capacity to do so. And so Wallace thought that brain power must have been caused by something elsewhere. Darwin picked up on these as serious problems, but he invoked his secondary mechanism of sexual selection to answer this and argued that, for instance, hairless men, uh, sounds a little bit like beyond the fringe, uh, hairless men are more attractive uh, to women uh, than hairy men. Uh, so take note of that, my friend. Uh, uh, and, uh, and also that human intelligence would be something which would have been under strong selective pressure because <laughs> rather flattering to, <laughs> to some of us because women prefer brighter guys to thickos. And so this is, the, uh, this is the sort of way. I should say that Darwin was very Victorian and uh, the, the progress is made through one sex and basically one sex only, but that, that's another matter, not for today. Okay, so. Then, so one of the questions then that Darwin realized that he must talk about if he's going to talk about humans, he's got to talk about religion, he's got to talk about morality. Now, what's interesting in The Descent of Man, let me go back to The Descent, to the descent of Man. Uh, what's interesting about The Descent of Man is that Darwin talks about human evolution, he talks about sexual selection, these things. He talks about God, but very briefly. By this time, Darwin had become an agnostic like a lot of Victorians. He was never an atheist. He was never an atheist and would have thought the new atheists uh, indescribably vulgar. Uh, but he was certainly uh, agnostic. But the thing is, like a lot of Victoria, he wasn't that bothered by God. He wasn't that interested. And so he tended basically to take the Humean line that it was all a big mistake, armies in the clouds sort of thing. And he, and he, that. But morality, on the other hand, was important that morality in a Darwinian world had to be discussed. So this was something that Darwin took very seriously. And there's extensive discussion in The Descent of Man. I'm just going to give you one quote. But if you go to The Descent of Man, you'll see that there's one, two chapters devoted to it. So Darwin is taking it very, very seriously. And basically what he wants to argue is that the struggle for existence doesn't just lead to nature read in tooth and claw, doesn't just lead to, to violence, but that often cooperation is a very good strategy for survival and reproduction. And what he argues strongly is that humans have exploited this to the full and that we've acquired, on the one hand, adaptations which make us safer to be around. Uh, for instance, we don't have claws and teeth and that sort of thing. So if Andrew suddenly gets you know, cheesed off uh, with uh, you know, uh, Alistair or something like that, Andrew comes in one morning and says, you know, I didn't like what you did, scratch, 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 or something like that, he's not going to do that sort of thing. And Darwin's also talking about, it, although he, being a good Victorian, he doesn't get into things like uh, uh, like uh, periods and that sort of thing. But he's basically saying that's the way we've gone. We've gone the way that we've been able to suppress our immediate sexuality so that we can associate and do all of these things. I mean, Darwin's very, I mean, he's very sensitive to the needs of that sort of thing. Uh, so, but basically what Darwin wants to say is that obviously morality is going to be a good strategy to take. That, in fact, the number of, certainly give an immense advantage to one tribe and advance in the standard of morality. Increase in the number of well-endowed men will certainly give an Im immense advantage to one tribe over another. So Darwin sees then that the evolution of intelligence and the evolution of a moral sense are not two separate things. It's not like we evolved and then culture came along and slapped 
you know, slap morality on us or something like that. I mean, Darwin's very sensitive to different moral standards uh, and things of this. And I'll be talking a little bit about this or different moral codes. But he's certainly absolutely convinced that morality is a good, if you like, paleite adaptive strategy and that the struggle for existence can certainly lead to that. Okay, well, the philosophers picked up on this sort of stuff very quickly. And of course, the leading philosopher, uh, certainly the leading moral philosopher in England uh, by the 1870s, I, uh, Mill died early on, uh, it was Henry Switchwick. And the philosophers didn't like it. The philosophers took umbrage at it. And Sidgwick, in the first uh, Mind, which is the leading philosophy journal to this day, Mind in the first, I don't think it's the first issue, I think it's the third issue, but certainly of the first year, Sidgwick has a fiery article uh, against, uh, against evolutionary ethics. He's against Spencer, but he also drags Darwin in and hammers Darwin, much to Darwin's chagrin, I might say. Then he continues with it in his books, and of course, uh, following Sidgwick was his student, G.E. Moore, who in, in Principia Ethica went after evolutionary ethics, and following him was his student, C.D. Broad, who also went after evolutionary ethics in his books. So what I'm saying is, from the beginning, evolutionary ethics, it wasn't just that it was wrong, but that it was one of those things with a bad smell. I, 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 let me try to put it in more religious terms. I'm sure you religious people, you meet people who've got different religious positions from you, and you come away and say, you know, I could never believe this, but I see where they're coming from, or I can see what they're, what they're up to. And then every now and then you come across something and they, they're explaining it to you. And I know you'd never use a word like BS, bullshit, but uh, you'd say, you know, it wasn't just that it was wrong, but it, 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 there was something kind of, not right about it, you know, some aspect of paganism or something. I really don't think they're interested in God. I think they're interested in sex, more sex, and yet more sex. And when they tell me that this is their holy communion, you know, it's not just that they're wrong, but there's, there's, an, there's, a, there's an agenda there that I find emotionally rather repulsive or putting off or something like that. And I do think it's been the case that for 100 years, evolutionary ethics was regarded that way. And it certainly was when I started doing philosophy back in 1960. I remember after my first ethics course, uh, it, you know, I, it was Hume, Mill, and then it was Moore. And Moore, of course, thumped, and, and then I think Stevenson. And Moore, of course, thumped right into evolutionary ethics, and exam time came round, and we all parroted the naturalistic fallacy and the, the sins of the evolutionists, and if we were lucky, got A's on it. Of course, in those days, you never got an A, you got a B plus. Uh, but anyhow, uh, so that was the way it was. And that was certainly my position uh, right through until the 1980s. And then, and this is the most awful picture I could find on the internet. <laughs> then, like St. Paul, uh, I had a revelation. And like St. Paul, you are, you are my Corinthians, you are my Romans, you are my whatever it is uh, that I've been preaching this ever since. You know, I have to come to faraway places, obviously, in order to do this sort of thing. And so what I want to do this evening is talk very quickly and briefly about evolutionary ethics. Uh, first of all, I'll talk to you about the traditional view, social Darwinism, which I don't think is right, but I don't think is stupid as often it's taken to be. And then I want to talk to you about what is often known as the evolution, well, today, not my term, is known as the evolutionary debunking uh, uh, position. And I didn't know about this until my students came in and said, we want to write dissertations on it. And I said, well, what is it? And they said, well, you're one, <laughs> much to my surprise. Let, let's start with ethics generally, ethics 101. Two questions, what should I do? Why should I do what I should do? Substantive ethics or normative ethics and meta-ethics. Now, just taking Christianity uh, as, as an example, not as, as the best, but certainly one as, as an example, substantive ethics says you should look after the poor and the sick and that sort of thing. I should say, incidentally, in every lecture like this, you have to have a picture of Mother Teresa and you also have to have a picture of Adolf Hitler. He's coming, okay? And then secondly, we have... Meta-ethics, uh, for a great many Christians, 
uh, what, why should I do what I should do? Because that's the will of God. Uh, now, I know that all about the youth pro problem, but I can assure you, when I was a junior young friend, a Quaker, many, many years ago, and pacifism didn't seem like a particularly wise strategy just after the Second World War, Ultimately, the discussion came down to, well, that's what God says, so get on with it. Uh, so as I say, I'm not arguing for this is the right thing. I'm just trying to show you there's these two kinds of questions which are asked in moral inquiry, and any adequate evolutionary ethics must speak to these. Well, certainly in traditional evolutionary ethics, known that you, Social Darwinism was a term used once or twice in the, 18th, in the 19th century, but it didn't come into general use until 1940, when historians started to pick up on it and apply it backwards. So uh, Darwin wouldn't have known what you meant if you'd called him a social Darwinian. I mean, he would have known if you'd spelt it out. But it, so it's, it's a term you can imply, but it's not a term that they used. Well, at the substantive level, most people think that social Darwinism means might is right. In other words, really is the Thrasymachus position from the first book of the Republic, and that might is right. And of course, uh, here's Hitler. Uh, many people think that, uh, and certainly many evangelicals argue strenuously, that Hitler was the epitome, the apotheosis, if you like, of social Darwinism, because Hitler does make statements in Mein Kampf, which certainly go along the ways of might is right uh, and that sort of thing. What I want to point out, though, is just as, for instance, uh, many, uh, many, let's say, many Christians were strongly, uh, well, many Christians, or certainly, let me rephrase this, some Christians were in favor of the Second Gulf War including a member of the faculty here, Nigel Bigger, if you look at his book in T Defense of War, argues that, in fact, a Christian should have supported the Second Gulf War. Whereas, of course, as we all know, many Christians were violently opposed to the Second Gulf War. So the point I want to make is that because one's a Christian, it doesn't follow that one is going to share all of the substantive prescriptions that are made in the name of Jesus Christ. And it's the same, that not everybody shares the same uh, prescriptions that are made in the name of Charles Darwin. So just as you have those who may or might, may not be uh, social Darwinians of this ilk, you've also got people like Prince Peter Kropotkin, who argued for some form of mutual aid and argued, therefore, that what we ought to do morally is support each other. You also have someone like Vernon Kellogg, the American evolutionist just before the uh, First World War, who in fact went to Belgium to work on relief in, in the First World War, and at least for a long time was a pacifist. He, he met the general staff and that changed his mind. And also today, for instance, um, uh, you have somebody like Ed Wilson, who's very much involved in the bio, biophilia movement and who argues that what we ought to do is support uh, ecology, environmentalism, and things of this nature, all in the name of evolution. Now, so as I say, the substantive ethics is a lot more diverse, which of course is what you might expect if you're going to take the, the subject seriously. What about the meta-ethics? What is the justification that these people all have? And in a word, it's progress. This is from Ernst Haeckel, I think, about 1875. And if you could see it down at the bottom, it's the monad, the blob. And up at the top, it's the mention or the human. In other words, what all of these people believe is that evolution isn't just somewhere going nowhere. It's progressive. It's going up to humans. This is a good thing. And therefore, we ought to aid the evolutionary process. And if aiding the evolutionary process is promoting, let us say, either might is right on the one hand, uh, uh, or, uh, on the other, I mean, or on the other hand, if it is uh, promoting, let's say, ecology, because Wilson's quite explicit about this, that humans cannot live in a world of plastic, that humans need biodiversity for full human flourishing. And so, therefore, we have a moral obligation in the name of evolution uh, to promote biophilia. So this is the point I want to make about somebody like Wilson. He's not just an environmentalist. He's a Darwinian environmentalist. And I don't mean just that his, his substantive ethics is clouded or is, is informed by uh, 
by evolutionary ideas, but that his metaethics, his justification, comes in terms of uh, evolution that he interprets as progressive. Well, of course, the problem is, uh, and so this is the position of Herbert Spencer, who was ardent progressionist, position of Julian Huxley, who again was an ardent progressionist, and as I say, is very much the position of Ed Wilson, who is equally an ardent, ardent, ardent progressionist. Uh, they don't take the naturalistic fallacy, they, they do not regard the naturalistic fallacy as a barrier. I wrote a, 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 an article once with Ed Wilson, and we pass it back and forth uh, once a week. And every time I get it, I go through it taking, take out naturalistic fallacy, or rather, take out attacks on the naturalistic fallacy, put the naturalistic fallacy back in up front. Then Ed would get it, and he'd say, take out the naturalistic fallacy. And so we ended with a rather tortured statement about uh, evolution is the basis for our understanding of ethics, where he took it to mean it's the justification, and I certainly did not, as you will hear in a moment or two. So as I say, it, progress is the big idea in traditional evolutionary ethics, social Darwinism. And of course, the trouble is, as Julian Huxley, and now I'm showing him, him much older, and he put this in his essay, Evolution and Ethics. What Huxley said is it's very dubious that evolution is simply progressive. Evolution led to the lion and tiger. It led to all sorts of violence, all of these sorts of things. So Huxley said, I'm just not sure that evolution is all that progressive. He didn't much care for humans by the end of his life either. And of course, Behind all of this is we have, even before G.E. Moore, we have David Hume, who said, quite simply, you cannot derive an ought statement, a moral statement, from a factual statement, a statement about the world. And so, obviously, then, if evolution occurs, you cannot from that deduce you ought to promote evolution. You're making a switch. Now, uh, there's a lot more I could say about this, and if we do have any time uh, for any discussion, I'd like to, I'd like to uh, bring this up a little bit, because, as I say, I think it's very interesting. These people simply, it's not just that they're mis I mean, it's easy to say they're mistaken. They've not heard of the naturalistic fallacy. These people want to deny that is ought barrier. They want to say that the, it's a, it's a Gaia-like thinking. They want to say that the world in itself has value. And it's ridiculous to say that looking, let us say, at the beautiful mountains in Wales or in the Scottish Highlands, that these are just exist. That if somebody came along and wanted, to, let's say, to take off the top of one of the mountains just for the, few, for the stone to build roads, the first thing you'd say is rape. And rape, of course, is something which brings values in. So as I say, I, I, we can bring it up in discussion, but I don't think this is a stupid position. I, it's not one I share, but I don't think it's stupid. Well, what's the alternative? Well, an alternative way is uh, the new, a different way of looking at evolutionary ethics. I think it's been around, but it, it's certainly popular in some quarters today. And as you see, I've just brought out a book with a, a very mysterious cover. And I couldn't for the life of me think why on earth they put a crab on, on the front. And I asked the publisher, and they had no, no idea. And so I ran a competition amongst the contributors. Uh, I, I offered them a free copy of the Darwin Encyclopedia uh, if they could come up with the best uh, solution. And the best solution was this book pr uh, proves definitively that we are all shellfish genes. And I, I must say, I thought that was pretty clever. I thought that was pretty clever. He certainly earned an encyclopedia from me. All right, so how do we go at it a different way? Well, first of all, the science. I think today's science follows up on Darwin. I mean, there's a lot of details you want to get into, individual group selection. We can ignore that for the purposes of this talk. I think that today's science backs up what Darwin says, that helping others, what, what evolutionists call altruism, can be a very good reproductive strategy. That, you know, as, as Ben Franklin said when they signed the Declaration of Independence, now, gentlemen, we must all hang together or assuredly we will all hang separately. In other words, working with others is a good strategy. But notice, altruism as used by biologists is 
is used metaphorically because when we think of altruism, we think of Alistair or, or Andrew uh, going and you know working with the sick and all of that sort of thing and taking the last sacrament and helping them to, to pass through life's phases and all of those sorts of things. And it's obviously, it's what Darwin was thinking about as a conscious, uh, intellectual, at some level sort of thing. But of course, a lot of animal altruism has nothing at all to do with desires or intentionality or those sorts of things. If you like to use a modern metaphor, they're programmed or pre-programmed to do what they do. But they're still altruists in the biological sense. And so, of course, are, as we now know, thanks to people like Joan, uh, Jane Goodall and Franz Deval, we know that altruism is something that figures very highly in higher ape societies. And... Uh, Despite what one sometimes thinks, uh, altruism is, is an absolutely fundamental part of being a human being as well. We have to work together. We have to work with each other. But I think that at, by this time, I think we can fairly say we've moved from the metaphorical to the literal. I would say that this woman helping this old man here is not doing something simply because she's been pre-programmed, the pheromones are making her do it. She's doing it, but perhaps part of her job, but she's also doing it because she feels, I've got a certain talent with old people or, or something like that. It wouldn't be for everybody, but this is something I can do and get satisfaction from and all of these sorts of things. So what I'm saying, and I think it's, I, I, I take it that this is fairly uncontroversial in biological circles, that we are literally altruistic. That means Mother Teresa types, if you like to make us biologically altruistic, in other words, cooperators, because cooperation is a good, a good reproductive strategy. It's, it's adaptive, it's paleo adaptive, that sort of thing. So now, th that's the background science. <coughs> so what does one want to go on and say, what about substantive ethics? What about meta-ethics, if you, if you take this sort of position? Well, I don't think substantive ethics is too very difficult. I think that substantive ethics for the, the, bio, the biological altruist or uh, for the altruist or somebody taking this sort of position, I think that substantive ethics is basically going to be what we believe in now. This is the, probably the best known uh, book of the second half of the 20th century uh, by a philosopher on ethics. And of course, what Rawls says is we must be just. To be just, we must be fair. And what is fairness? Well, Rawls, Rawls says, put yourself in the original position where you don't know what position you will have in society. How would you like society structured if you don't know where you're going to end up? If you knew you were going to be a white male healthy, you might say, well, pay white healthy males more than anybody else. But you don't know. You might be small, runtish, uh, either female or, or male or whatever. In other words, you'd lose out in such a society. So what you want is a society which is going to be okay for that person as much as for the person who, you know, is the football player and all of those sorts of things. And so he says we've got to distribute. It doesn't mean to say distribution is going to be identical. If, for instance, we decided we had to pay doctors, let's say, more than garbage people because doctors have a long training and so we've got to induce them to do this because we'll all be better off if we have people who are doctors as well as garbage people, then it might well be that in a fair society we pay doctors more than we pay garbage people. But it, the point is, it's fair. It's something which is done because it's fair. Now, I would say this is... You can't get more Darwinian than this. And in fact, of course, Rawls himself, in a footnote, I think it's 4, 499, nobody ever gets that far in the book. Uh, they all pretend they do, but they don't. Uh, uh, and uh, Rawls says, how does this come about? Obviously, the original position is a philosopher's fantasy. There was not a group of old blokes or old blokes and blokesses who sat down one day and said, let's put ourselves in the original position, blah, blah, blah. No, it came about through evolution. And so Rawls says, I'm quite prepared to believe that it came about through Darwinian evolution. Now, he does go on straight away to say, this doesn't justify it. And that's the point I want to bring up in a moment. But he does say that I think it does. And so, as I say, I don't think that this kind of position offers uh, great challenges to traditional ethics at the substantive level. Although it will point to certain anomalies, for instance, that... From an evolutionary point of view, 
you're going to care about your own children more than the children of others. Doesn't mean to say you don't care about the children of others, but there's obviously going to be a push that way. I mean, suppose, for instance, somebody told me about Alistair, and they said, you know, Alistair and his wife, they are wonderful people. Do you know they give 90% of their income to, not Oxfam these days, I gather, to the Salvation Army, you know, which can go and do good and that sort of thing. 90%? But they've got four kids. What about the kids? Oh, well, we've got a very good goodwill or whatever it is downtown. And so they go down there about once every three months and sort through it to find f clothes for their kids. Uh, and so they're really very good. And then when it comes to food, well, they're very good. They're all vegetarians, you understand, but they buy uh, porridge oats by the, by the sack. And, you know, they, they don't do badly. My attitude would be that Alistair's buying his way into the kingdom of heaven on the back of his kids. Uh, and I... Uh, not just Alistair, let's take, uh, let's take any one of you. Uh, 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 I, th I think we all have an instinctive feeling that we have certain, uh, certain obligations. Uh, David Hume is very good on this. So this is, I'm showing you the Bleak House uh, because in Bleak House, Dickens is absolutely savage with Mrs. Jellyby, who's spending all her time on the natives of Burraburagar and completely ignores her own family, and in particular ignores Joe the crossing sweeper. And basically Dickens is saying charity begins at home. So again, I don't think that Darwinian evolutionary thinking is going to be opposed to the way that a lot of us think about uh, morality. Well, what about metaethics? Well, you can't justify it with evolution, not if you're a human like me. So what do you do? Well, maybe there is no justification. Maybe there is no justification. Maybe ethics is all put in place by evolution to make us good cooperators, to make us good altruists. But what it does is it gives us these sentiments that we ought to care for it others. But of course, it's got to do something more. And this is a point that J.L. Mackey uh, pointed out. It's got to objectify these emotions. I mean, it could well be that Alistair and I differ about spinach. Sprouts. This is the big thing I have with my wife. I love sprouts. I truly love sprouts. My wife loathes sprouts. Now she's discovered a way of baking them with all sorts of things. And she's so pleased. I think they taste revolting. <laughs> now, it doesn't mean to say that my wife is an evil, well, it doesn't mean to say my wife is totally evil because she doesn't like sprouts or that I'm totally good because I like sprouts. It, 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 at least at some level, it's subjective. And of course, you can get into arguments about you ought to eat your greens and that's, that's a different sort of argument. Uh, but on the other hand, morality is a different sort of thing. If I say, I think, let's say, I think that uh, it was morally wrong to treat those, uh, those uh, West Indians, the Windrush people, in the way that they did. And uh, one of you says, well, I'm not sure. They were, you know, they were blacks, they were you know, foreigners. I, you know, I, don't. I would want to say to you, I don't just disagree with you. I think you are wrong, objectively, truly, morally wrong. And so this is basically what I want to argue. So it's like what is known in the trade as emotivism, even like prescriptivism. But the thing about emotivism was it said morality is nothing more than I don't like rape, boo-hoo, nobody should like rape. Prescriptivism is more like I don't like rape, don't you rape. But it, so it didn't have a, 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 an underneath objective foundation. And I want to say, no, the meaning, the meaning of morality is more than boo-hoo, I don't like it. It's, it's wrong. It's wrong. So in other words, I want to say that not only do we have these emotions about morality, but we objectify them, and that's part of our biology. It wouldn't work if we didn't objectify because people would start to cheat. And so that's what I'm saying is going on here. So why, why, am, I, why, why am I inclined to take this position? Now I'm going back to the origin. Now I'm going back to the, to, well, no, sorry, I'm going back to the descent of man. I'm going back to Darwin. As I say, I don't think Darwin was ever a philosopher, but of course he'd been brought up uh, in, as an a upper middle class Englishman, gone to Cambridge. So of course he'd had an awful lot of philosophy in, in his training, not just Plato, but Aristotle and uh, more recent writers as well. And so Darwin was sensitive to this. And basically what Darwin says is that had evolution gone another way, and it could readily have done so, 
we would have a very fundamentally different substantive ethical code. And what he's saying is if we were reared or we'd grown up in the conditions of ants or, or, or bees or something like that, then our moral code would be very different. That come the winter, the females would feel that it's their moral obligation to kick all those lazy males out of the nest. The fact that they're going to die is just too bad. Morally, what we ought to do is look to the welfare of the nest, and that means males out, which is obviously very different from the kind of substantive moral morality we've got. And so basically what Darwin is saying, and I think he's right, is that morality is a function of our evolution. But evolution, if it's not progressive, if it's not going up to one sole way, then it could go different ways and we could have different moralities. You might want to say, well, one of them might be right. Yes, but we don't know. And we start to get into all sorts of conundrums about maybe we've got the right morality, but we can't be sure that we've got the right morality. Maybe a different morality might be right. I like to talk about, in human terms, what I call the John Foster Dulles uh, system of morality. John Foster Dulles was the Secretary of State under Eisenhower. It, during the Cold War, he hated those Russians. He, he, he didn't like them at all, but he knew that the Russians hated him. And so they got on, not because they liked each other, they felt, but because he felt that he had a, a moral duty to, to hate the Russians. He knew that they had a moral duty to hate him. So let's sit down and see how we can move further. And I think these would be a, this would be a very different sort of su substantive morality. So as I say, this is why I, I think one can make a case for this. Does this mean that we can go out and, and rape and pillage? This is a, a 1917 uh, poster that actually I first saw in the Imperial War Museum down you know, South London. Uh, uh, and does it mean that we can just go out and, and rape and pillage? No, of course it doesn't. Because what I've, as I've just been explaining to you, what I call the Raskolnikov problem, Remember, Raskolnikov killed in, in, in uh, Crime and Punishment, kills the old woman. The detective knows that he's done it, but the detective won't arrest him. He waits until Raskolnikov can no longer live with his conscience for having done it and confesses, and that's the whole, mo that's the whole point of the book. And so what I want to say is we're not going to go out and rape and pillage because of our biology. Our biology makes us very uncomfortable about doing these sorts of things. We all know sometimes when it comes up and we say, well, I think I've got to do this, but I'm feeling very uncomfortable about it. I'm not sure that what I'm doing is right. So that's why I think Darwin is relevant to ethics. And don't forget David Hume. And now just one little addendum. So is this atheism? I don't think it's necessarily atheism. I mean, I've not introduced God into the discussion, but I don't think you have to introduce God into every discussion <laughs> to show that you're not an atheist. And uh, I want to say it's not necessarily, it's derived, as I say, from what I would call a methodologically naturalistic position. In other words, I'm trying to get it all out at some level of, 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 of the laws of nature. So, I'm not committing the naturalistic fallacy. I'm doing an end run around it because I'm not trying to justify morality. But I would want to say, how might a Christian accept this? Well, search for a Christian position that is naturalistic. Search for a Christian position which is likewise trying to base itself on the laws of nature. And of course, this is precisely what St. Thomas Aquinas argued that we should do. He, uh, he distinguished between eternal law, the rational guidance of created things on the part of God, we can call the eternal law. The participation in, in the eternal law by rational creatures is called natural law. So, of course, what a Thomist wants to argue is that what we should do is that which is natural, and that what we should not do is that which is not natural. And I feel that that's precisely what the kind of Darwinian like myself wants to argue. Now, it doesn't mean to say we're not going to have disagreements, but I do feel that a Darwinian and a Thomist certainly have an awful lot in common, and except, of course, understanding what is natural. And, of course, there are going to be big debates about that. For instance, is homosexuality natural? And of course, what I find interesting is how so many gay rights people spend so much time not just arguing we should be allowed to do it because we want to do it, 
but we should be allowed to do it because it's natural to do it. And the, the number of articles I've read which says homosexuality is, is to be found in every species of animal that anybody has ever discovered, and therefore it's natural. So this is an argument which I say is going on. Now, I'm not saying it's the only argument. So I, I do recognize that there are going to be major disputes about what is natural. So I'm not saying all this sweetness and light, but I do feel that this is a way that I think Christians, uh, traditional Christians, and uh, although I'm a non-believer, I'm a very conservative non-believer, uh, 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 that traditional Christians and I think traditional Darwinians have a, a good future together. Thank you. Well, I'm sure we want to thank Michael for a very, very stimulating lecture. In the moment, my colleague is going to chair a time of Q&A. We are aware that we're running a little bit late, so if any of you do need to leave, please feel free to slip out. But we've had a wonderful lecture. I know it'll be a very good discussion, so please stay if you can. Okay, any questions? Come on, Andrew. <laughs> I'm going to move the microphone around because otherwise it doesn't record on the uh, machine. So. Thank you, Michael, both informative and entertaining as always. Um, I want to talk to you about nothing buttery statements, because I was actually giving a talk in Manchester just uh, this morning, and uh, one of the examples I gave was um, uh, these nothing buttery statements, like we're nothing but apes that got lucky, or we're nothing but slime mold. And it was a popular song in this country about 20 years ago. <laughs> um, you and me, baby, ain't nothing but mammals. And it's a very rude second line. But... How do you avoid evolutionary ethics becoming um, nothing buttery? Because um, you know it it's, it's provides an explanation, but the mind kind of then closes and says, "And there's nothing more to be said," which doesn't follow, but it's powerful rhetorically. Well, it might be powerful for you, Andrew. Uh, as I think of you as nothing but slime mold, I'd never really <laughs> thought of you in those terms. Uh, surely, though, nothing buttery. I mean, oh, it's nothing but another Vermeer is, you know, putting the speaker down rather than Vermeer. I mean, yes, I mean, we are nothing but mammals. Yes, but being mammals isn't, you know, is, is something. I mean, yes, we are nothing but mammals in the sense that we can't fly, you know, just like that. We don't have wings. Uh, obviously, that's true. Uh, but I, I, it, it's... I think what's, being happen what's happening here is what philosophers call an emotive definition. We're sliding in disapproval through the way of introducing it. And I'm not sure that I would want to say that that is entirely fair. No, if anything, my own feeling is, if you want to look at it from outside, I think that I or my, my fellows who think this way are, are glorifying humans in the sense that we are saying at some deep level, and I feel very strongly about this, that the mark of being human is, the mark, is, is to be a cooperator. That at some level, what, even more than being on our hind legs or uh, having uh, suppressed uh, overt ovulation, I mean, these are all crucial parts of being a human uh, or being intelligent, but being s not just cooperators, but so good at it. I mean, ants, ants can be great cooperators because if they lose, let's say, a thousand ants in a flood or something like that, it doesn't really matter. We can't, I mean, it, there are days when I think, you know, how many kids have you got, Mike? Well, I've got three, but one of them's just gone to McDonald's and it rained, so let's say two. Some days that's a very attractive thought, but you know it's not really. Uh, that we've we cannot, we've gone the route, or as Americans would say, the route of having just a few offspring. And that means we can only do this by various sorts of things. It's, it's, it, again, it's like <coughs> male parental care. I mean, we, we may not be as good as all of the birds, but the men, as, I, as one sees, proudly walking their kids up and down the high street, as I saw just a few, few minutes ago, are not evolutionary wackos. I mean, they're doing it because of their biology. So I don't take that nothing but, yes, but what a wonderful but we are. And so I want to say that I'm doing anything but putting down human beings. I think that what I'm doing is, I, I, I'm, 
I'm dubious about using words like glorifying them because I, I've, that's almost like getting back into progress. Uh, but I, at, at a certain level, I do. I, I, I showed you that picture of the mad ape, you know, stop this mad German. Uh, I'm writing a book on war at the moment, and I'm using that as my cover because one of the things I want to argue is that we've been too hung up by people like you and uh, uh, Augustinian uh, original sin and saying, you know, we're going to go on sinning so it's no good, war's going to happen. And I want to say, if you start to take biology seriously, you know, we, we're not killer apes after all. That they, I mean, certainly war occurs, I'm not denying that, but that there's good paleoanthropological evidence suggesting that we're not killer apes in that sort of way. So in a way, uh, you know, Mine's a, mine's a Quaker position. <laughs> I think the chap at the back in the, in the striped okay. shirt, yeah, the, the, the sailor-looking chap. Give him the thing, because I'm a bit deaf, so then I can hear you. I'll try to speak loudly. Oh, you do that. Um, I, I love the talk. Uh, thank you very much. Um, what, what do you think decision-making looks like within an evolutionary ethics? Is it just what is more natural, and how do you decide that? Or is there some other metric? Well, of course, again, I hardly have to tell you that ethics is a complicated thing. And when we make moral claims, we're not just using ethical things. We're using our empirical knowledge or what we think is. So should I, you know, should I slash open Johan you know, tomorrow like that? Well, if I'm a murderer, no. But if I'm a surgeon and he needs heart surgery, yes. And of course, so the thing is, in both cases, the question is, what ought I to do to a fellow human being? I ought to treat him as an end in himself, let's say the categorical imperative. Uh, but how I treat him as an end in himself is going to depend very much on, on circumstances, on empirical things, and things of this nature. So my own feeling is that an awful lot of the discussion is going to go on more at the substantive level than at the meta-ethical level. Now, I'm not denying that isn't to say that one might come up with some very interesting meta-ethical things about how you know, evolution makes us more programmed in some respects than in others. And I could, that would seem to me makes perfectly good sense. I mean, let's face up to it, you've got to be programmed to eat you know, on a regular basis. You, don't have, you need to have sex, but you don't necessarily have to, Despite the views of my undergraduates, you don't necessarily have to be programmed to have sex every half hour on, or, you know, on the hour or something like that. Uh, so you see what I mean. I mean, so I would say that there's going to be an interaction of both of these. But the thing I want to say is, let's forget a hundred years of philosophy, uh, you know, and of ignoring Darwin. Let's stop seeing Darwin as a threat which people like Alvin Plantinga do, which people like Thomas, I mean, it's not just the Christian, Thomas Nagel, Jerry Fodor do. But let's see that we've got a wonderful theory here, which really is working. And let's see if we can do something with it, which of course is absolutely the tradition of St. Augustine. It's absolutely the tradition of Anselm. And it's certainly the tradition of Aquinas. I mean, all of these people, you know, would have thought you were nuts to turn your back on modern science. I mean, Aquinas is doing, I mean, Augustine's doing it all the time. He says, I'm, a, I'm an educated, civilized Roman. I'm not, a pal you know, I'm not a nomadic Palestinian like, like uh, Israeli, like, uh, like Abraham. So obviously, I'm going to think in different sorts of terms and those sort of things. And that's what I'm trying to say. Now, I think there was somebody, yes, the woman, let's take the woman at the back here. Uh, two short ones. Thank you for your lecture. Uh, so I was thinking about the relation between uh, practical and pure reason. So uh, regarding your, your uh, lecture, I would like to ask, uh, does evolutionary ethics include or exclude uh, moral progress? And the second one related to that would be, uh, is morality in evolutionary ethics a um, type of methodology of evolution or it's rather its purpose. Well, you mentioned pure and practical reason, which of course is the Kantian distinction. So let me say 
that I think at some level there has to be a counterpart to what I've been saying about evolutionary ethics, which also goes to e evolutionary epistemology. Now, I certainly don't think that everything we do and see is just simply a function of the genes. I, you know, I'm enough of a realist to think the way the world is matters. But I would certainly be sufficiently neo-Kantian in this. And in many respects, although, you know, I'm not sure how Kant would react to this sort of stuff. But obviously, in certain respects, this is Kantian because Kant doesn't, Kant doesn't believe, want to locate morality in the will of God. He wants to locate it in you know, the rationality uh, of human beings interacting. And he wants to say this is the only way. So I certainly think at one level, one's got to be prepared to have at least some sort of Kantian view about epistemology, thinking, for instance, that <coughs> maybe mathematics and some of these things are put in place because they have their evil evolutionary adaptive rather than otherwise. It, it, it's, it's better to think 2 plus 2 equals 4 than 2 plus 2 equals 5. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm quite comfortable with that sort of thinking. Uh, but going back to, the, the, you know, to moral thinking, and this does put me in mind of Kant, and I don't know whether this is answering your question, but it's a question worth answering, is I'm certainly differing from Kant in the sense that I don't think that you get morality just out of pure reason, as it were, which I think Kant is trying to do in his philosophy. Kant wants to say that these are the necessary conditions for rational beings to, to exist together, to cooperate. And the only way you can do this is through the categorical imperative, through treating others as ends and being prepared to universalize. Now, I'm quite, I'm, in many respects, I'm pretty comfortable with Kant's conclusions, but I, as I think Darwin would want to say, is there's no, ne no necessity to the position I'm taking, not in the Kantian way, but it's much more almost pragmatic. And incidentally, uh, I think Peirce uh, thought that he, he could be more Kantian than he could. And William James, I think in his book, I think it's on pragmatism. William James is very good on this and puts his finger right on this and says, yes, I want to take a pragmatic position, but I realize I've moved on from, from Kant. I mean, I think James sees more of a division between himself and Kant than we would 100 years later. I think he's trying to push himself apart. Whereas I think 100 years later, we can be a lot more relaxed about it and say, yes, but I really think Kant was on this path. So if, if somebody said to me, well, at some level, you're a neo-Kantian, I wouldn't take that to be a... Um, a criticism anymore if somebody said you're a Darwinian, so you're a neo Christian. I'd say, you know, in a way, you've got a point. <laughs> Go on, you've got to make you, you're not. Yeah, but I'm curious about the possibility of moral progress because evolution makes us progress. Well, I think we do have the possibility. Yes. Well, I do think we have the possibility, although possibility is, not, is more of a Kantian term that I'd be prepared to use. I think we have a, mor a, 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 a moral understanding, if you like, that, that we can articulate as a moral code. Obviously, we do it to a certain extent through our culture and things like this. And for instance, as we're seeing, uh, some cultures like Darwin's are much more patriarchal than other cultures, uh, certainly like around my own house, for instance. Uh, you know, I, I would never dare run my life as Darwin seems to run his. Uh, but I mean, I, so I do see culture coming into it. But at the same, same level, I, I feel a great empathy for the way that Darwin was thinking. At least, I think some, yeah, the man in the, man who needs a haircut. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I think women like hair, but uh, anyway. You see, yeah. I've got a different moral code from you, mate. This, this, this isn't just Sprouts, friend. Yeah, this yeah. is a deep moral failure. If my housemaster had seen somebody like you, boy, God, it would have been a, a rough, you know, ten minutes. <laughs> Anyhow, please, please. Well, I think you look very nice. Well, um, so I, I followed uh, the, the first uh, three, three quarters or so of your talk with great uh, approval. Uh, I, 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 you know, you were rejecting that naturalistic fallacy totally behind you. You talked about how 
um, what sort of meta, meta ethical position can justify substantive ethics and you said you know maybe we can't and I was like great yeah I like this but there was one one point you got to where I stopped I didn't quite follow I think it could be just that I don't understand so maybe this is just can you please explain for me again because I'm a bit slow but so when you got you 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 were talking about someone uh, with respect to the Windrush example you said some someone's telling me something that seems racist and I want to be able to not just say to them I disagree with you but I also want to be able to say to them you know I also think you're you're actually wrong like your 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 racist values are actually really bad values and I don't understand how you're using evolutionary ethics to be able to help you say that because e evolution is, is a it's 100% a descriptive theory so um, it can ha I can see how it can ha a knowledge of evolution can help us in all kinds of ways with practical ethics how knowledge of psychology which is informed by evolution can help us uh, make sort of workable effort but but yeah how th that bit how does that work I, I can't help feeling I'm in the same position that a Christian would be let's say arguing about abortion and I suspect for instance that Quakers and Catholics could argue to the you know the end of the world about abortion and uh, obviously though what they're not really arguing about is you know the, the ultimate moral basis they're arguing about what is a human being and so Catholics are going to say things like, well, as soon as you've got, you know, something that the heartbeat, this is a human being. And I suspect a Quaker is going to say something like, no, until you've got the point of uh, being able to survive on your own when, when you're born, you're not a human being uh, and all of those things. Now, notice that what we've got here are, are more factual discussions. So let's suppose, I mean, let's suppose I'm the racist and, and Alistair is not. And I say, I just don't call those blackies should be shipped off back as quickly as they can. And he says to me, no, we made commitments to these people. We have a moral obligation to them. Now, I don't think my first move would be to say to Alistair, well, of course, I'd expect that from you, a Christian, because I don't necessarily, where I live, I certainly don't expect that from you as a Christian. Uh, so my first move, I, I'm sure, would be to make things like, well, can we look at the obligations that were made to these people at the time? Was it the case? I mean, there was a case in the Guardian yesterday about some woman from Canada who'd lived here for 40 years and they want to kick her out. They said, you don't have any papers. And then finally they found in an old passport a stamp which says allowed to live forever. Now, that I take is a factual thing which, which alters should this woman be kicked out or should she be allowed to stay? I don't think it's got anything to do with the moral you know that moral level it's it's all to do and I think I think a lot of the Windrush thing would be along those lines because ultimately it would be things like do I does do we think that black people are equal to white people and things of this nature so as I say my own feeling is an awful lot of this is going to be much more down at the factual level than up at the meta ethical level but ultimately I think we just have to say in, at some point that uh, I'm sorry, you know, we just, we have different moral intuitions or something like that. I suspect, ultimately, I get to that point very quickly with, with Hitler. I think we will need to stop here. Well, I'm sorry that I turned up late, but as I say... Uh, <laughs>